Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Raul Portales. Actually, Polish people can pronounce my name and surname properly, not English, but I'm going to talk about Andrew Thing's very, very basic introduction. So a little bit about me. I'm a Google developer expert for Android. I'm originally Spanish, as you may have guessed, uh, but I live in Dublin and I've been doing Android for a lot of years. And currently I work in a company called OneView Healthcare when we work in Revolut Dionysian patients experience in hospitals and retirement bills and so on and so forth. We do a little bit of IoT as well, but this is mostly my personal interest on tinkering with physical things. So, Android Things was announced, I believe, in December past year, and it is a version of Android tailored for the Internet of Things. What does it mean? Well, it means that it's smaller, although it's still quite big, it's smaller and it's dedicated for handling peripherals that are not standard like a phone could be. So the first big thing is that there is no need for UI. It's not guaranteed. This does not mean that you cannot have UI with Android things. What it means is the operating system will not work as if there is a UI because you can build something that you can put in the wild. It doesn't need to have a screen at all. So if any API requires you to use UI, it will probably not be available on Android things because it's uh, non-mandatory. But you can have your own UI on Android things if you want to. So permissions are granted automatically. This dialogue of, do you want to grant this permission to this app? Yep. In which UI are we going to do it? No, we grant them automatically, even the dangerous ones. Although some of them require you to reboot after you install the app to be granted, all permissions are granted automatically. And even there is a flag of ADB, you can pass it, and then the permissions are granted without the need to reboot. So it's pretty cool. And as I said, not all intents or APIs are supported because some of them require UI, like a Google sign-in. How are you going to sign in if you don't have a UI? Well, you don't. And some of them were work in progress. So in December, we got developer preview 0 0.1. Currently, we are in developer preview 0 0.5.1. And a lot of uh, um, APIs have been progressively added. So some of them are still not there, but the list looks pretty good. Yep, so unavailable ad mob. Yeah, I mean, you don't really want to show ads if you don't have a UI. Google Drive, Firebase app indexing, it's really linked to browsing. Um, Firebase authentication, dynamic links, invites, Firebase notifications, play games, yeah, sign in. You know, you see the theme. If there are things that are not really needed on Android things, but everything else is actually there. Um, when I say Firebase notifications are not, but Firebase cloud messaging is, so you can actually take your IoT device, register on Firebase, send a notification to trigger whatever action on it. That will work. Uh, so this is not production ready yet. So there are a few dev kits that have been uh, ready for Google so you can start working with them. The idea is that you do this for prototyping very rapidly. Once you have a design that you like and you say, I'm ready for mass production with this, then you send it and then you can build it at the scale. So the first version of Android Things were supporting uh, the Intel Edison and, and Joule. They are discontinued, but they, they still work with the old versions of Android Things. There's a Raspberry Pi tree in there, uh, which is, is added to the dev kits mainly to support enthusiasts and hobbyists that want to tinker with it. And the other ones in the bottom are the different versions of the MPX uh, boards that are more designed for the Internet of Things than a Raspberry Pi. A Raspberry Pi is literally a very, very small general purpose computer. But it's cool. So there is no emulator. And it's like, it, it makes a lot of sense. Why would you have to emulate something if you're working with hardware? Half of the things you do with Android Things is hardware-based. 
So you will have to have a virtual breadboard with all the resistors and everything. So, so far, no one has made a proper emulator and I don't think they will. You really want to test this on the hardware. It's your own custom hardware you're working with, so you probably want to test the things on it. And a Raspberry Pi is very cheap. So what I want to do today is to lower the entry barrier to make Android things as accessible as possible for everyone. So this is what I don't want you to be doing on your first contact with Android things. This, this looks very intimidating, even for me as well. So this is one of the dev kits that was announced, the Raspberry Pi 3 and the Rainbow Hat. The Rainbow Hat is a set of sensors all together packed that you can put on top of the Raspberry Pi and it will allow you to play with LEDs, buttons, etc., etc. So it is compatible with the MPX IMX 7D which if you went to Google Developer Days in Krakow a month ago, you would have got it for free. How many of you have one of these? One, two, three. I have one as well. And this is a really cool kit. It has a touch screen and a camera as well. So the Raspberry Pi, uh, sorry, the Rainbow Hat is also compatible with this dev kit. So what it has is four LCD alphanumeric displays right there. Temperature and pressure sensor, bear with me, this was a very smart move. They put them under the LCD, so they're in the bottom. So if you write a weather station with your LCD showing the temperature, it starts heating up and the temperature sensor is just behind uh, after it. So uh, it will start heating up and it will start showing wrong things. So if you try to do that, expect it. <laughs> It's not meant to be mass production, it's just for fun. Um, this the RGB LED strip, is seven LEDs with RGB colors, three LEDs, red, green, and blue, three buttons, and a buzzer, which is also underneath that allows you to play several frequencies. Um, that's kind of nice. So all in all, you have a lot of things in here. Many people did say, yep, I can do this with Python as well. Like I put this on top of my Raspberry Pi, I have the pin in, pin out, and then I can do this with Python. I, yes, you can, but Android Things is meant to leverage Android knowledge and libraries. Do you know how to write Android code? With a very small effort, you know how to write Android Things code. Do you know how to use a library on Android that does something that you find interesting? You can use it on Android Things. You can use Firebase Cloud Messaging, you can use Retrofit, you can use TensorFlow, you can use Image Processing, you can really use anything you want. So all those libraries are not available in other platforms. That's one of the things that make Android things so powerful and versatile. So how do we set this up? Very simple. Android Studio, SDK Tools version 24, Android SDK version 7.0 or higher. That's it. So I'm assuming all of you have this already. The nice thing you have to do is you have to download the uh, OS version for Android Things and flash it. At the moment, you have to log in in the dev console, select the uh, dev board you have that will download an image that you flash it onto the SD card and then you put it into the Raspberry Pi and it will work. It's not ideal. It will probably improve in later versions. And this is the current developer preview version, 0.5.1. And the next thing you do after you flash the image is to configure ADB and Wi-Fi. Uh, do not try to connect over USB with a Raspberry Pi. It will not work. The USB on the Raspberry Pi is just for power. <laughs> you have to connect over Wi-Fi. By default, an Android Things broadcasts itself as android.local in the local network. If you do ADB connect android.local, it will find it. If you have other phones or Android TVs or other things on your local Wi-Fi, it may get confused. So. The other solution is to plug um, HDMI output to the Raspberry Pi. It will show you the internet address and then you can do it. 
if you want to configure uh, another Wi-Fi, there's the shell command that you have to, to run to connect to Wi-Fi, to configure it. It's, it, it works. So, so the first time, you probably want to configure it using Ethernet. <laughs> uh, once you have it done for the first time, it's all very nice. That's one of the drawbacks of the, of the Raspberry Pi. And the NXP does ADV over USB Type-C, which is really cool. So if you have one of the other boards, you forget about the uh, setup of Wi-Fi. You connect it to your computer on the USB Type-C, and you can do ADV as you would do with a phone. So yes. That's, that's the reason why I move away from the Raspberry Pi. So the first thing you do is you have to add the Android Things support library to Gradle. Just one line into dependencies. That's it. On the manifest, you have to declare that you use the library Android Things. And then you have a new intent filter that says IoT launcher. That means whenever this IoT device boots, this is the app that is going to run. They are designed to run one app at a time. You can have another intent, your normal intent, so you can launch your apps on, uh, on the Android device using Android Studio. But if you want them to boot automatically, you have to add this. And then you get your main activity, and you write your IoT coding on a start. That's simple. Now, you can handle peripherals directly like this. This is the code to uh, control a button. So you get the peripheral manager service. You open the GPIO point, uh, port by name. Then you set the direction if it's uh, on, on high, or on, on low. It depends if it's a capacitive button or a press button. Then you set the edge trigger, so which is the value at which you consider it to be on or off. And then you register a GPIO callback, and then you can do this. So if you ever done Arduino, this is how you write code in Arduino. But Android things can make things easier. As I said, there's a, there's a talk later about uh, test and augers about layers. Uh, developers love layers, so Android things put layers on top of it. So you don't have to worry about the pinouts and the protocols. You don't have to know what I2C is or PWM. You don't have to remember all this. This is the pinout of the Raspberry Pi with all the different protocols and what you don't need to know that to start playing with Android things. And that's the whole lowering the entry barrier thing. So, as I said, Ogres. User space drivers are drivers for buttons, LEDs, uh, LED strips, LCDs, LCD uh, displays that allow you to interact with them without knowing the underlying protocols. They are very handy. And then, um, if you have the rainbow hat, this is actually a meta driver, which is really cool. Instead of include every one of the drivers into the dependencies, you have the rainbow hat driver, you put it into your dependencies. It recursively gets all the drivers that it needs. It sets which uh, GPIO port and which uh, pin everything is, and you just have to use constants, or even less than that. And if you're really, really lazy, there's an Android Things template project that has all this already set up, so you just have to check this out and have it. This is my own project. Google released another one that is exactly the same a couple of months after I did this one, so you can use that. If you use Android Studio 3, there is a wizard for IoT Things, so all the things about tweaking the manifest and adding the first uh, dependencies, you can Forget about it, just use the, use the wizard. So now, for code. This is how you handle LED in the Raspberry Pi with Rainbow Hat. GPIO, a LED, Rainbow Hat, open the LED red. This will open the LED red. You can set the value to true or false. That will turn the LED on or off. And then you just close the LED. It's actually very important to close everything that you open when you work with Android things, because you are opening a connection to a pin. So you open it at the beginning, and you close it at the end. You can do it in a single method, opening and close, or you can do it at activity level. On a start, you open everything that you need, and on stop, you 
close everything, but it's very important to remember to close the objects. But that's, that's the simple. The LCD, you have a class that's called alphanumeric display, get rainbow hat, open display, set brightness at the maximum, set display ABCD, set enable true, close. As actually set enabled is false by default, and if you don't set it to true, you may, as I do, look at it for one hour, trying to figure out why on earth it's not showing the display. Um, it's another thing that, because it's hardware, it keeps the state. So if you run an app, and that app enables the display, and then you run another one, and you forget to set call set enable to true, the display will be enabled because the previous app was enabling it. But the next time you reboot the Raspberry Pi, if you don't run the other app first, it won't be so. Remember to call set enable always. It's the only trick for this one. Temperature sensor, also very simple. You open the sensor, you set the oversampling, and then you can just call read temperature. There is a way that you can configure the sensors so they work like Android sensors with callbacks every time they get new data, but this is a slightly simpler. What more? The RGB LED strip is a little bit more complicated. So you open the LED strip, it has brightness, which is global for all of it. And then um, you create the color as an array of different formats, like HSV, for example. And then you just write the array of colors. This uh, uh, writes a uh, rainbow style color. Uh, I actually have a pull request pending to handle individual brightness on the latest strip, but it's, it's still not finished. Oh, well, you will be able to handle individual brightness in the next version of the Rainbow Hat uh, uh, drivers. What else? Buttons. A little bit simpler than the GPIO mode. You open the button A, and you set an unbutton event listener, and then you close it. <coughs> Unfortunately, button is not very reliable. Uh, it works most of the time when you do two, of, two or three of them, sometimes you start missing the key up or key down, but there is a much better solution, which is called, yep, it's called input drivers. So you, cre you create a button input driver, and then you assign it a key code. And what it does, when you call register, is that it will call on key event of the activity. Exactly the same as if you were having a keyboard. This will allow you to have as many buttons as you want, map to keys, and work like that. It is very, very handy. You have to add this permission, manage input drivers. This permission requires you to reboot. So the first time you install an app that uses button input drivers, it's a little bit of a hassle, but they work a lot, a lot better than buttons. For the plain sound, you just open the PSO buzzer, you set the frequency you want to play, you wait, then you stop, and then you close it, and it does work. Um, so from there on, you can, you can go into more tinkering. You can have the Sidekick basic kit. It's a, it's a very cool kit that was originally designed for Arduino with lots of things, LEDs and resistors and temperature sensors and uh, tilt sensors and light sensors. And on the right, you have a few proximity sensors, more servos, um, ah, lots of things. So there's lots of things you can do. My current project is to um, write an autonomous car similar to what a Roomba is, but just for fun. And I think that's it. Have any questions? Yes? Uh, is it uh, possible and reasonable uh, to create uh, configure grad Gradle that way that uh, one flavor of the app is an IoT uh, app and second uh, flavor of the app is a normal uh, mobile app? I so, because you're going to work with hardware, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to have it as an Android app 
that has a flavor. You know, you're going to work with particular hardware, and I don't see how much code you can reduce to, so having the same app makes sense. Okay, I, but, but for example, you got a Raspberry Pi and this second device. So creating a flavor for each device. No, I, I think you, you have to create two different, two different apps because the Android thing one is all about the configuration of the hardware, and the, the one you will have in your device is, will be about communicating with that hardware. I can see them as different modules in the same project, yeah. but I don't really see them as different flavors of the same app. They are, they are really different apps. Okay. Uh, what happens if I don't close the resource and I will try to use it again? Uh, it will throw an exception. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Uh, is it possible to create uh, Android things for uh, any other board than Raspberry Pi and those three that you show? Uh, not at the moment. Uh, I would expect that to be the case when the, um, when the developer preview phase finishes. So right now they are iterating very fast into providing all the APIs for, for all the boards in a way that Android Things is complete. Once they have it complete, I would expect them to open to more boards, but I don't really know. I would expect so in the long future, but when it is ready for production, it's not ready for production yet. This is, this is a developer preview. Eh? <laughs> so when it gets to that stage, I would expect it so, yes, but not now. When it does uh, hit production, do you see it uh, overwhelming the market? I mean, do you see it uh, more successful than lighter OSs that usually work only on uh, uh, C, C++, and maybe Python? <laughs> this, this guy has earned the MOOC. <laughs> that was a very good question. <laughs> um, it has its advantages, and it has its disadvantages. Um, if you look at something like an Arduino, an Arduino is much harder to write code for, but it, it takes a lot less battery power. So you can, you can run it on the wild for a lot longer. But Android Things comes with security updates over the air automatically from Google. So it is actually a more secure system. I would see Android Things succeeding in places where you can have them plugged in, or even as an as a IoT hub. You know, like you have smaller devices that are all around the place with simpler boards, and then you have an IoT hub that gets all of them and provides a, a higher level of, uh, of access. That, is, that role, I think, Android Things will do really, really well. Uh, smaller devices, I am not that convinced. It is reasonably expensive hardware, and it's really high power Power demands. I mean, you're, you're, we're talking about dual cores here, <laughs> so it's it's a little bit of an overkill to bring a bed, uh, a LED, right? So before you think of any more questions, I'm going to show you. Um, this is one example I have with my Raspberry Pi, and it says "kit" on it because I I'm old, and it's like a Knight Rider style, and then you can make it go faster and faster and faster or slower. Oh, you can stop it as well. Uh, yeah. Slow, slow, slow. Yeah. And also the, the, the LEDs and the buttons do work um, whenever you press the button. So that's one example of the things you can do with Android Things with the rainbow hat out of the box. Uh, this is open source as well. It's there on GitHub. If you're interested, I can share the source code for this one. Uh, what is your like basic use case scenario? For example, I have an Android app and I have a temperature sensor, mm -hmm. um, and I want them to communicate. Like I want, for example, the temperature to be updated every hour on my phone. Can you maybe tell us quickly, like which libraries would you use on both projects? How would yeah. you communicate between them? Sure. So that's a very good use case. What you would do is you, you will have the temperature sensor with Android things. And the, the simplest way to make it work is that whenever there's new data, this uh, Android Things device communicates with Firebase 
raise the temperature data on there, and then the Android app reads it from Firebase, so they don't have to communicate directly. Firebase cloud messaging, right? No, 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 Firebase database. Oh, okay. So you just, you just write the temperature in Firebase, and then you use the same key, and you just read it from the other device. So this one is writing the, the, the data on the, on the database, and the other one is, is uh, reading it. Would you could, as well, configure an API or send messages from one to the other, but the, the easiest solution is to, to write it on a Firebase database in the middle. And you could put like a clock on this temperature, um, temperature sensor, like to, I don't send it every hour? Yeah, that's, uh, okay. well, I mean, you can do anything you, can do with, you want to do with Android. You can use uh, exact alarms, and exact alarms. Uh, you can use timers uh, if you want. Uh, there, all the things are available on Android things. That would make it very, very handy and versatile. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you can open all of your resources in OnStart and then close them all in OnStop. When exactly is OnStop called? Like, what <laughs> triggers OnStop being called? Ideally, when the device is shut down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you are if you are developing, uh, every time you redeploy, you will you are stopping an activity and starting uh, and starting it again. So if you don't do that with your resources and you are actively developing, you're gonna lead into problems. Once the device is on the wild, you would expect that to have only one activity and be always on. So on production, ideally, never. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, did you try to measure a performance? I mean, uh, did you try to toggle GPIO and measure how fast you can go with uh, Android things? No, I have not. Um, that's one of the concerns some people was talking about, is that it isn't really as fast as an Arduino can be. Uh, I don't know, I haven't measured it. And as I said, it's still developer preview 0 0.5.1. If there are issues with the speed, I would expect them to work on them. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be serious about measuring it before it gets to the 1.0. Uh, actually, my concern was about stability of such uh, toggling rather than uh, uh, stabili speed. stability of the signal. Yeah, I mean, uh, how? Oh, okay. okay, if you are, um, for example, if it would be one milliseconds, okay, how how much stable it would be uh, if you measure it by oscilloscope? Uh, this is rather, I, this is my question. Yeah, I'm sorry, I haven't I haven't measured it, but it's my understanding that it's actually quite stable, but I I haven't measured it myself. So if you if you want to know more. There is a sorry. There is a, a lot of tutorials on Android things and examples where they do from a smart doorbell, where you click on the on the on your doorbell. There's a camera takes a takes a picture of the person, sends it to Google Play, sorry to Google uh, Cloud for images processing, and if it recognizes the face, it tells you who is calling. Things like that. There is another one that uses TensorFlow to identify um, dog breeds. So you have an Android here, and you click on it, and you have a photo of a dog in front, and it talks back to you saying, I see a Dalmata, or I see a German Shepherd, or stuff like that. So there's lots of uh, interesting examples of things that you can do right now with Android things. And it's actually lots of fun. So I, I encourage you to, to try them out and play with it. And once you're familiar with the rainbow hat, you can start digging down into what exactly GPIO is, or I2C, or PWM, and playing with servos and other stuff. But first is to the, make hardware very accessible to play with the rainbow hat. And once you're interested, you can start putting a breadboard, starting doing your own circuits and stuff like that. There's no point in learning about pull up and pull down resistors and all that stuff before you know that you it's like, ah, this is fun, and I want to play more with it. So I hope you want to play more with Android things after this talk. And if you do so, like, ping me on Twitter. I would love to see it. Thank you. Thank you.